The following program is made possible by the partners and friends of Ronnie Phillips Ministries International. You were created to be more than you are now, to love more than you love now, and to live a life that's fully alive. Take a few minutes and join Pastor Ronnie Phillips for a message of grace that will help you live fully alive. And you're locked into Western philosophy, Plato and Aristotle and all that stuff, Western civilization. You gotta think through it, figure it all out. Well, you go to hell figuring stuff out. I have not seen nor you heard not talking about heaven, talking about the supernatural gift, what God has prepared for you. The biggest regret you'll have when you get on the other side is when you discover what was available to you by the Holy Spirit that you never laid hold of. And when you are surrounded and don't understand where it's coming from or where it's going or what to do, as a steward of the mysteries of God, as a manager, you have the right to pray with the understanding and with the spirit to release the resources and manage them that God wants to release in your life. Greetings, partners and friends. This is Pastor Ronnie Phillips, lead pastor of Abba's House and founder of Ronnie Phillips Ministries International. This is Fully Alive. Today I want to tell you how you can live fully alive. You know, many of us live a mundane existence. We just go through our routines, our rituals, and we live until we die. I believe God has more for you. I believe God has more for me. Into faith, we can go. You must learn the principles of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. Faith will propel you into your future. Faith will make hope a reality in your life. You can't have it if you won't believe it. Today I want to tell you how you can believe God for more. So into faith I go. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. So it matters what you listen to and it matters what you speak. Number one this morning in laying a foundation for faith, faith is the foundation for the manifestation of Christ in us the foundation for the manifestation of Christ in us. Colossians says that the mystery of the gospel is Christ in us, the hope of glory. The Bible says greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. There is a mystery there, but faith is the force that brings the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of earth. Faith is believing in that which you can't see. Faith is the ability to look at that which is not and call it what it is, what God said it would be and what God said it can be. Faith is the manifestation of the outpouring of miracles in our life. You won't have miracles if you don't have faith. You can't get saved without faith. And you can't live the Christian life that will result in godly works, not your own works, without this principle. You need faith. Faith is not a religious word. I spent many years uh, speaking to football teams and in public schools and they would say, now you can't say Jesus, but you can say the word faith. I can't talk about faith without talking about Jesus. And when I get to talking about Jesus, I get excited because Jesus is is our reason to walk by faith, to believe for more, to expect more, and to desire that others may have the kind of faith that he's given us. Faith is the foundation for the manifestation of Christ in us. Hebrews 11.1, 1, the famous chapter on faith, it's the roll call of faith. God remembers all the saints who operated in faith. Some even before Jesus was born, they couldn't see the fulfillment, but they walked by faith anyways. It says there, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. I'm telling you, life is not worth living without faith. You need faith in your life. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16 says this, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law. Basically what this is saying is knowing that a man has not been found innocent by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. 
Rules won't get it done, my friend. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith, just as if we'd never sinned by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. So it's more than just a generic term. It is the foundation for the manifestation of God's power in our lives. We should speak faith. We should believe by faith. We should walk by faith. We should be thinking of not the virus, but the victory in this season. God has promised his church more. Now, if you want to live by doom and gloom and you want to keep your head down and you want to go hide in a corner every time something bad happens, that's your prerogative. But I'm talking about a faith-filled life. It doesn't mean that your life's going to be without problems and bad diagnoses and circumstances and you're not going to lose loved ones and experience difficult times, but it means you've got some hope inside you, hope for eternity, hope for another dimension, hope for better days, hope that speaks a better word. You've got something inside of you and when it gets made manifest, you have to walk by faith and others need the faith that you carry. Others need some, some encouragement in this season. Others need it, and you have to choose to walk in it. Number two, faith is God's gift to us all. It is a gift. There is faith as in what you believe, but there is a gift of faith that God has promised all of his children that follow him. Ephesians 2 verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. By grace you've been saved, unmerited, undeserved favor through faith. Through believing in that which you can't see, and faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. So you can't obtain grace if you don't have faith, because you got to have faith to see it, amen? Through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Faith is God's gift to us all, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship. So God's works are our works because we are his workmanship. He created us. He formed us in our mother's womb. He knows our name. And if we're saved, we're in the Lamb's book of life. He, he knew what we were going to do, who we were going to be, how we were going to act long before we were even in existence. The Bible teaches us that. So we've been given this gift of faith created in Christ Jesus for good works. Nothing wrong with good works as long as they're not dead works, as long as they're not religious, ritualistic, judgmental works. I'm talking about God works. I'm talking about loving the people Jesus loves. I'm talking about doing that which Jesus did, saying the things that Jesus said, and walking in faith as Jesus did. These works God prepared beforehand so that we might walk in them. God wants us to walk by faith. God doesn't want us miserable. God doesn't want his people miserable. And he wants, when a lost person comes into our atmosphere, he wants them to feel the kingdom. He wants them to see the manifestation of miracles. He wants them to look inside of a saved person's heart and into their eyes and go, there's something different about that person. There's something different. Yes, they struggle. Yes, they're covered in flesh. Yes, they may look different, but there's something inside of them that I'm missing. And those kinds of experiences lead people to faith in Jesus Christ and gives them the foundation that they need so that they can receive the gift of faith. We need faith in this season. Christian people ought to be speaking faith. Stop putting your faith in earthly people. I'm talking about faith in a king that's king of a kingdom. Amen? Jesus brought about a kingdom. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. I'm talking about a theocracy. Faith is God's gift to us all. Number three, faith is a lifestyle, not an emotion. Faith is a lifestyle, not an emotion. Being raised as a spirit-filled, full gospel preacher and as a son in the ministry, I must say that I understand emotionalism. Sometimes God gets the credit for our own emotional experiences. If all you did was come to an altar and have an emotional experience that didn't result in change or a miracle in your life, then friend, all you did was have a therapy session. When God touches you, you were forever changed. Doesn't mean you were a perfect angel, but it means something's different about you. You've been marked by the power of the Holy Spirit. We've spent too much time 
over the last 20 years trying to replicate that which has already happened. We've spent too many thousands of t minutes and millions of dollars trying to go back to a movement that's already passed. God's calling us to a new movement, my friend, a faith movement. God's calling his people to rise in this season, not retreat. He's calling us to rise, and we have to answer the call. We have to answer the bell. God is wanting a new move of God that's not about the show you can put on at an altar, but it's, a, it's about authentic change that results in your everyday day moving speaking kingdom shaking life God is calling his church to more and the only way to access that more is to speak faith believe faith and walk by faith God wants so much more out of his church and out of his people and we've got to get off our religious rituals and routines and we've got to embrace kingdom and we've got to go out beyond the walls of the church and see God do something I'm thankful for a number of things through this pandemic uh, but a few of them are that number one I've returned to my first love I didn't get in this thing to preach to a large amount of people I got in this thing for the the gospel of Jesus Christ and to help people who are hurting and if anything has happened in my life it's taken me back to my first love feeding the hungry loving on those in the struggle preaching the gospel uh, it's not about the corporation of a church it's about the cause of Christ and this has brought me back to why I got into this in the first place I'm telling you God has used this time to 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 really he, he is measuring the difference between pretenders and followers God God wants to know what church is really going to be after his call and his kingdom and what church is really going to be out doing the work. We are not to be political outposts. We are to be kings and priests and sons and daughters. And the real church is rising and the real church is thriving in this time. The real church is not retreating. The real church is not chewing its fingernails wondering if it's going to survive. The real church is looking around going, how can I serve somebody? How can I get the gospel out right now? How can I reach people in innovative ways the real church is not worried about this pandemic the real church is focused on the prince of peace the real church is not focused on a virus it's focused on victory my friend and I don't know about you but I'm going to go ahead and call it as I see it we have already won this war over this virus the church is still going to be thriving the church is alive and well the gospel's going out into all the world and we are better now than we were before because we have returned to our first love faith is a lifestyle not an emotion it comes as I've taught you from the Lord it is activated by the Holy Spirit that brings the kingdom of heaven to the kingdom of earth and it is lived out through your mind, your will, and your emotions. Through your mind, your will, and your emotions. Hebrews 11, the roll call of faith says this. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtained a good testimony. By faith, you're going to hear this phrase many times over the course of the next few verses. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible, which science will, will back that up with atoms and protons, neutrons, and electrons. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. His blood speaks a better word. By faith, Enoch, that walked with God, was taken away so that he did not see death. Yes, it is possible that your faith could cause you to walk with God in such a way that you do not see death, and was not found because God had taken him. For before before he was taken, he had his testimony, Enoch did, that pleased God. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Faith is foolish until it starts raining. Faith is foolish and still it starts raining. Remember Noah? Never been rain on the earth, never been a flood. He said, there's going to be a flood. They said, you're a fool. You're an idiot. Oh, they made fun of him. If you had social media today, he would have been called a zealot, a word of faith preacher. They'd have laughed him off, off the whole country. Oh, but when the ark started being built, they had a change of tune. And this is what it says. By faith, Noah 
being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. Faith is taking a word of God and walking that thing out. Sometimes you just gotta faith it out. You gotta walk it out. You gotta believe it when nobody else will or you're never gonna have it, my friend. Ah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph, Moses, crossing the Red Sea, Jericho walls coming down, Rahab the harlot who God called a woman of faith. She was a prostitute and God used her. Gideon, which I'm talking about next week, an underdog farmer who found faith, Barak and Samson, David and Samuel. Oh, this is a roll call of faith, but I go to this passage of scripture to simply tell you it has been done before, it can be done, and it will be done again. Faith is a reality to all who believe and are willing to follow after Jesus Christ. And all these, it says, Hebrews 11, verse 39, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not yet receive the promise because Jesus hadn't came about yet. Ah, but they walked by faith anyways. I'm telling you, you've got to walk this thing out if you're going to obtain a good testimony. Number four, faith sees what we can't. Faith sees what we can't. Many years ago, I studied um, behavioral science, and in behavioral science, they talk about what is known as the reticular activating system. This is a nerve network in your brain stem connected to your spinal cord, and it acts as a gatekeeper for your mind, and it has to do with your memory. Science tells tells us that it can be trained by what you say and what you fixate about. For instance, if you fixate on negativity, that's what you will have. If you are are in the market for a red sports car and you've looked it up online and you fixated on this red sports car, when you are driving on a busy highway, your mind will automatically be drawn to a red sports car because that's what you have been fixating about in private. When you speak something regularly, it alerts your reticular activating system and it causes you to see that which you've been fixating on. Oh, faith is the same way. When your mind is fixed on Jesus Christ, and the word of faith comes from your mouth, then automatically you are going to be drawn visually to that which is of God. You will see things that others can't. Faith sees what we can't, but our minds can be trained to live by faith, to speak faith, to have faith, and to walk faith out. You can look at Genesis 50, and you can look at Joseph when he's about to die, and he's prophesying and blessing his sons. He said to them, I'm dying, in Genesis 50, verse 24, I'm dying, but God will surely visit you. I'm dying, but I'm still declaring faith over my sons. I'm dying, but I'm still believing in the promise. I'm dying, but I'm believing that my kids will have what I didn't have. Come on, somebody, wherever you are. I'm believing that my grandkids will have it better than I had. I'm believing that every failure that I had, my kids will have the victory over because life doesn't end with me, friend. It ends with Jesus Christ and what he said. And I'm telling you, it doesn't end. He gets the last say and he's coming back for his church. So no matter what your condition is, what your diagnosis is, you keep declaring faith all the way to glory And I promise you, your generational blessings will flow long after you're gone. Faith is not positive thinking. It's not hoping for the best. It's not a wish upon a star. What you see can be affected by what you think. And what you speak sends a signal to the mind. Faith sees the faithfulness of God throughout the generations. It sees the power of God. It sees the peace of God in the midst of death. It sees a resurrection, streets of gold, eternity, eternal life. It sees what others refuse to see because the Bible says the natural man receiveth not the things of God. The natural worldly man living for the lust of today with no hope for tomorrow can't receive the spirit of God. They can't even see the things of God. They can't hear the things of God. That's why you must be saved and you must embrace faith in Jesus Christ so that you can go where he's called you to go, have what he's called you to have, and be what he's called you to be. I'm talking about when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, we shall be brought to pass saying death 
is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? Hell, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior. We have been given victory through the power of Jesus Christ. So we don't have to live for today. We can live for tomorrow to, for tomorrow, and we can put on incorruption and immortality because of the power, the manifestation of Jesus Christ with us. Paul would say, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He said, through the grace given to me, everyone who is among you shouldn't think of himself more highly than he ought. Don't think you're better than somebody you're not. All you have is because of Jesus Christ and whatever faith level you have is because of him. So don't stick your nose up to air at other people. Just speak faith into them so that they might obtain what God paid for you to have. That's the way I live my life. Not that I'm better or than anybody. I just grabbed hold of a faith promise that I want others to grab hold of because God has blessed me with it. But Paul says here, God has dealt to each one a measure of faith, a metron, which basically means God has given each one of us a level of faith. My level may be different than your level, but he gives us all that we need to do that which he's called us to do. So don't get into the comparison game. Oh, this person has extreme faith and this person doesn't have faith. No, focus on your own faith. God has given to each one of us a metron, a measure of faith. So God has given you enough faith to be who he's called you to be, do what he's called you to do in this season. You don't have to retreat or run. God has given you, and you were born for this, you were born with enough to do that which he has called you to. Finally, number five, faith makes hope a reality. Faith makes hope a reality. I love the Gospel of John because it presents the Gospel and the seven signs in the Gospel that I mentioned to you last week. But one of my favorites, because It shows the living Jesus that breaks religious traditions. One of my favorite miracles in John is John 5. And it says, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So Jesus uh, rejected a religious ritual to go where God called him to go. That's faith. Faith is not constricted by religious activity. Now there is in Jerusalem a sheep gate by by the pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For when an angel went down, he would stir the water up, and whoever stepped in the water first got healed, was made well of whatever disease they had. So this man had been sitting there 38 years. He got used to being sick. He got used to his family and friends having to to carry him to this pool, hoping for a miracle every day. And he got used to making an excuse for why he couldn't get his miracle. He got used to complaining about the person who got into the water before him and got their miracle when the water was stirred. This man's whole way of life had become a routine. Some of you, and there's nothing wrong with being sick. I, I believe there are people who are sick and there are people who are disabled and I'm not hitting those people. But what I'm saying is some of you have developed a mind mindset of death, a mindset of illness, a mindset of poverty, a mindset of addiction, a mindset of failure. And no matter what I say or any preacher says, you are going to continue to think that way about yourself. And if I have done anything today, it's to tell you that you are not what you keep saying about yourself. You are not what you think about yourself. You are not what that person did to you. You are not what that person said to you. You are more than a conqueror in Christ Jesus. You just have to activate your faith and you can walk and become who you were supposed to become. Jesus walks to this man and he looks at this man and he says, do you want to be made well? And this man, it, you know, he's looking up and he goes, well, I've been trying, but every time I try to get in and he starts making excuses and Jesus said, no, I'm not playing with you and your warped mindset. I mean, for real, do you want to be made well? And then Jesus says, rise pick up your bedroll and walk. And this was on the Sabbath. And this man carried his bedroll. And the religious community could not even celebrate the fact that this man had been healed. They were already on him because he was carrying his bedroll on the Sabbath. He had offended the religious establishment. Jesus had offended them because he healed them on the Sabbath. And they asked this man, listen, 
who, who, who healed you? Why are you carrying your bedroll? He said, I don't know this or that, but what I know is this man said, rise, take up your bedroll and walk, and I am healed. And then Jesus saw him in the temple, and Jesus said, sin no more, lest something worse come upon you. In other words, Jesus is saying to him, do not go back to that mindset. Do not go back to that mindset of failure. Do not go back to that sick mindset. In June of 2005, when I came back to the Lord, I didn't know what lied ahead for me. And I really didn't care. I just wanted to be saved. I just wanted to be free from bondage. I just wanted to let go of all that pain and that anger and that bitterness and that sin uh, that was just weighing me down. I just wanted to be free and I just wanted to be obedient to God. But I had to make a faith choice. I had to repent, which means to change your mind. I had to get on my knees in my house and ask God to forgive me and tell God if he wanted this mess, I would give it to him for his glory. Little did I know that I would one day pastor the church I grew up in, that I dreamed about pastoring as a small child, that I'd go to the nations, that I'd go to the White House. Look, I'm from Hickson, Tennessee and Saudi Daisy, Tennessee, small cities, but God has taken me places that I can't even explain to you. Why? Because I made a faith decision in June 2005 and I've continued to make faith decisions. I've trusted God to take my mess and make it a message. He's no respecter of persons. God wants to use you. God has a destiny for you. I don't care what you're doing right now when you're watching this. I don't care if you're in the biggest mess of your life. If you will trust God, repent, and believe by faith that He can take you out of the mess you're in, He will do it. And in three or four years, you'll look back and go, my goodness, look at the sovereignty and the goodness of God. Faith will take you places that human reasoning and human skills can't. So I challenge you to start today by making a faith decision. If you're lost, if you don't have peace with God, just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I repent of my sins. Come into my heart and save me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use me for your glory. By faith I believe this, Lord, and I'm trusting you. If you prayed that prayer, go to RonniePhillips.org, register that decision with us. We'll help you get started. Consider becoming a monthly partner with RPMI. We need you. We're touching the world, but we need people to make this dream become a reality. God bless you. We'll see you next time. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. It's time for the Church of Jesus Christ to make a comeback. And I believe if you'll be here for the Comeback Conference, God will bless your life. You're going to hear from some of the most anointed speakers in the United States of America. There's going to be every generation represented here, the kingdom in full manifestation. You do not want to miss this conference. Whatever you have to do to get here for all of it, make plans to be with us. I believe every word, every session is going to change your way of thinking, your way of life. It's time for the church to rise up, not be ashamed, put aside fear. It's our comeback season. I believe God's about to move. It's a setup for a great revival. I'm ready. Are you ready? Let's make a comeback. Pastor Ronnie Phillips delivers help and hope around the world through missions, media, and the message of grace. Go online to RonniePhillips.org to partner with Pastor Ronnie today and join us again next week for another message that will help you live free and fully alive.